I really appreciated this past uh, sermon series on growth um, and sanctification. Um, and uh, this, you know, is just so important in our spiritual walk, um, constantly growing, constantly evolving, constantly changing. And uh, I thought, you know, I'd just kind of keep the train going, right, and speak one more week on, on growth and uh, growth uh, in terms of spirituality. Um, one thing, I'm trying to get my, I'm trying to get this uh, presentation slide control to work. And uh, I don't know, I might have to have and control the slides in the back there. Um, and so um, in doing so, as I came up with our, uh, this, this talk today, I decided to make a title slide, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, uh, in making this title slide, I, I, I looked at Pastor Chris's past title slides over the years, but you didn't do that, Pastor Jonathan. <laughs> so I looked and I, I was like, like, okay, what? What, you know, would Pastor Chris like, right? What is, he, what is he thinking when he's making these title slides? And after studying all of his title slides, I realized Pastor Chris is a very simple person. He's a simple man when it comes to artistic design. He likes straight lines. He doesn't like, like, curly cue, like, little cute, like, little lines and stuff. And he doesn't like, like, really flashy colors. He likes very simple, basic, basic stuff. So... I want you to see my title slide on growth, all right? Let's show that up there. <laughs> simple, right? Really simple, right? Straight lines. Not like Pastor Jonathan's. Let's show Pastor Jonathan's. Little <laughs> curly cues, little cute little designs. No, no, no. See, so uh, I'll have to have Pastor Chris weigh in on what, you know, what his, what his pick is. Mine's a little simple, maybe a little too basic, but... Um, um, Nevertheless, um, whenever, whoever else is coming up here to speak, you know, the gauntlet has been laid, right? Let's see what you guys can do, all right, with your title slides. Um, as I was preparing for this sermon, however, um, I was trying to think of an illustration, like what is a good illustration that I can bring in uh, on growth and development? And uh, I thought kind of a fun one uh, would be based on my, uh, my love for coffee and some people might call it an addiction, but I'm just going to say my love and passion for coffee. And I've been, um, uh, I, I had to think back on this, but I've been roasting my own beans for about 15 years. And I initially started with a small handheld popcorn popper. And uh, you have to get a certain type, otherwise you're going to scorch your beans. And you'd take about a quarter of a pound, you put it in the bottom, you turn it on, you have to do it in the garage, otherwise you get kicked out of the house. And like you're stirring with this little wooden spatula, and there's smoke everywhere, and there's chaff flying everywhere. And you, you know, you'd roast these beans, and, and then you know, you, you enjoy your cup of coffee. And so I've been doing that for a long time. And lately, in the past year or two, I've like, I, you know, I've been gifted an espresso machine by my beautiful wife. And I've been trying to learn how to do latte art, right? It's a lot harder than, than it appears, right? Because it's not just about the pouring part. It's getting the milk right. And that's, to me, that's the hardest part, is getting the consistency, the milk just perfect so it pours, like, well. And so, um, but that has been a labor of love for me. And I have been practicing and practicing every morning, like, you know, I'm practicing and um, I thought I would show you my growth and development, all right? So let's put up the first picture. I'm going to run through these. And please <laughs> do not let your, your imagination wander, okay? Just, like, see it for what it is, all right? All right? Let's just, some, some of these might look like human beings, some elephants. Another one looks like an atomic bomb. Uh, but, and some of these are not in any order. Let's, let's go to the next one. This one's a little bit too. All right. So this is the next one. And then uh, kind of looks like a human with his big, I don't know, big hair, head of hair. And the next one is the elephant. And then the next one, atomic bomb. Uh, the next one, I don't know what that is. That's just crazy. Uh, and then the next one, oh, it's starting to develop, right? Yeah. And then the next one, oh. And then let's go to the next one. And then the next one, oh, that's so cute, right? Uh, uh, how about the next one? Oh, 
I don't even think I could repeat this if I wanted to. That's just crazy. All right, how about the next one? Oh, look at that, huh? All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Now, I could have shown you the ones that I made the past three days, but they were terrible, all right? So, and some of these are not in any kind of chronological order, all right? I just thought I would just show you some, some development. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer as we, uh, as we start. Father in heaven, uh, we just thank you so much for this, this time that we can spend with family and friends and I just pray that we would just have a great time today worshiping you and that we would hide behind the cross and that all we would hear and see is, is you and your words. We pray this in your name. Amen. Um, one of the earliest sermons that I can remember um, ever having, you know, the, the opportunity to, to speak, um, I had to think back and uh, it was during my college year, my senior year of, my, uh, of college at a school called Pacific Union College. And uh, it's in Northern California. Some of you have attended there as well. And uh, my senior year, I was part of the, uh, the student association or the student body. And I shared an office in the campus center with my good friend, Sheila Atiga, who was the religious vice president at that time. And one day she leaned over and she looked at me and she says, Ken, um, uh, we have student week of prayer coming up in a couple weeks and I was wondering if you could be one of the speakers. And Student Week of Prayer is kind of a religious emphasis week where every day uh, one of uh, the students at that school goes up and gives the sermon or the talk. And when she asked me, I, I was like, oh man, I was really like conflicted inside because, you know, deep down inside, I, I knew I had no business going up on that stage and speaking on behalf of God to the student body. And, you know, I, I really thought about it. I thought, you know what, this is not going to work because I have to speak to my friends and my peers who are sitting out there who, who know me, right, who hang out with me on the weekends, and they know the things that I do, the, they, they know my, my, you know, my hang-ups and my faults and all of everything about me, right? How is it possible that I can go up there and speak on behalf of God to them? And I was really torn, and I was like, I, I had to think about this. And Sheila and the ca campus chaplain, you know, would constantly come up to me and trying to convince me. And finally, they, they said, you know, um, we're not looking for perfect people to come up front and speak. We just need honesty and let God take care of the rest. And so I, I reluctantly agreed to do it. And then I thought, what am I going to talk about? Like, what, what can I talk about? And as I thought about it, I thought, you know what? Let me, I, I, I talked about the one thing that, that I, I, I wanted so much in my life at that time, and that was change. I wanted to be different. I, I longed to be different than what I was at that moment. I wanted to experience growth, right, in my walk with God. I didn't know how to do it, but I, that's what I longed for. And so that's what I talked about that day, that I wanted to change. I wanted to be a different person than I was at that moment. And I remember even now the verses that I, that I used that day, and we're going to read those verses. It's found in Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 14. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. And it says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? This is like perfect. It's so perfect. You just forget what's happened in the past. You forget what happened yesterday. You forget the mistakes that you've made up until now, and you just look ahead, and you press on toward the goal that Christ has already achieved for you. 
right? And I clung to those verses, right? And I spoke about those verses that day. And that was 18, it was in 19, 18, 1989, right? I am old. Uh, that was 1989, my college senior year. And I was, as I was thinking about it, I realized that those words ring so true even today. Even as I stand here right now, it's like those, those words are so apropos to my life right now. You know, God in his grace and his mercy has allowed me to grow. I'm, I'm definitely a much different person than I was then. And he has helped me, he has pruned me, he has watered me, he has nurtured me to be different than I was back then. And I have grown, not as much as I would have liked, but, but he has. But I want to grow so much more. You know, I want to be so much different than I am right now. I want you to do a, a, a mental exercise with me right now. And that mental exercise is, I want you to think about some pivotal moments in your life, right? Some times in your life where you have experienced and seen God in a powerful way, right? What are one, two, or three times in your life where God has, like, just touched you, right, and said, here I am? I want, I'm going to give you a few seconds. I want a little bit of time to think about this. When have you experienced God? All right, think, think really hard. Whenever I've asked the youth this question, whether they're junior high or high school, college age, the answer is pretty similar, especially within our church, and they're usually big events, right? Art of worship, for those of you who don't uh, know art of worship, art of worship is a, a week-long praise training clinic, I think, that our church is, uh, that is heavily involved in planning uh, where the youth come and they, like all day, they, they learn how to play their instruments and work as a team and, and, and learn how to do praise and why they do praise and the meaning behind it. And that is generally on the top of the list as, as far as the, the times where the youth have seen God. Other times are camp meeting, either a, a spiritual weekend retreat for girls only or the guys only for the youth. Sometimes it's a, a weekend, you know, kind of a revival meeting. And I would venture to guess that for many of you out there, your answers are probably pretty similar, right? It might be a mission trip. It might be camp meeting. It might be some sort of revival weekend, catalyst, or, or something else that you attended where you're in an auditorium with thousands of people and just worshiping and praising God, and, and the Holy Spirit just really touches you. But I hope that I can interest you today in contemplating the main point of today's message. And that is, most growth occurs in the quiet, dark spaces of your life. Most growth occurs in the quiet, dark spaces of your life. And we're going to kind of unpack that today. Uh, to do that, we're going to start off with uh, an illustration found in your own body. And from the medical field, um, it is very well established and well known when growth occurs. And growth is controlled in your body by your growth hormone, right? Growth hormone. And do you know when growth hormone is released? I think you probably most of you know this. When is growth hormone released the most in your body? When you sleep. When you sleep. At nighttime, 75% of growth hormone is released in the deep phases of sleep. The Lancet uh, produced a graph, and we'll sh I'll show that up there. And this graph shows you when growth hormone is released. And the top graph is normal sleep, right? And uh, the bottom lines is time, right? 6 p.m., 10 p.m., 2 a.m. And you can see on the top where growth hormone is released the most. This is kind of a, I'm not exactly sure when they went to sleep, I think 10 o'clock or something like that. But you can see that big spike of growth hormone at 2 a.m., right? You're fast asleep, it's like, whew, right? 
The bottom graph is someone that is sleep deprived. Someone who's going to bed really late, maybe eats that big bowl of ramen like at 12 o'clock, 10 minutes before you go to bed, Ryan. And, um, <laughs> and you just get a fitful night's sleep, right? Not really good rest. And you can see that you don't quite get that big spike, right, of growth hormone. Interestingly enough, do you know when the remainder of the growth hormone is released? That other 25%, the majority of that 25% is released when you exercise. Sleep and exercise. So I guarantee you, all you parents out there, will take this graph. That's the only thing you're going to remember this entire sermon, <laughs> right? It's the only thing you're going to remember, right? You're going to go home and say, Uncle Ken told you to sleep and exercise. I've been telling you that for years. Come on. Right? I, but you know what? There's some method to that madness, right? I mean, in the quietness of the night, boring, nothing happening is when you grow and when you repair your body. Spiritual growth, strangely, is so similar, right? So similar to this physical growth. And also in our natural world, in nature, the Bible actually refers to nature as an illustration of spiritual growth over and over again. If you look in Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8, uh, it brings out the parable of the sower where there's a person who's sowing seeds, spreading these seeds, looking for this great harvest, right? And as these seeds fall on the ground, in verse chapter 15, it says, this about that, and it says, and the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently, patiently produce a huge harvest. Patiently produce a huge harvest. Growth, whether it's spiritual or whether it's physical or in nature, is a patient, slow, steady process happens when you are alone, away from the crowds, away from the auditorium, away from the church building, away from the awesome sermons, away from the crazy praise. It happens when you're sleeping in the dark, quiet places of your life is when spiritual growth occurs. Now, let me show you four examples of how Jesus sought growth and nourishment in his life, right? We're going to look at four examples in the Bible. Um, Luke chapter 5 tells us of a, of a man healed of leprosy, right? And Jesus has just, just performed this crazy miracle, and there's this, like, high-pitched frenzy amongst all those people there in complete disbelief that this man has been healed of leprosy. And instead of Jesus capitalizing on this amazing opportunity to legitimize, right, his claim as the Son of God, instead of him saying, you know what, I'm going to establish my ministry here, and I'm, gonna, I'm really going to, like, kickstart this ministry of mine on this earth, instead of doing that, in verse 16, what does he do? He says he withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. It says he did this often. He withdrew by himself to the wilderness to pray. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 tells us of this crazy miracle that Jesus performed where he, he feeds 5,000 people. He takes two small fish, five small pieces of bread. He breaks them, feeds 5,000 people, 5,000 men, right? Some people think if you include all the women and children, maybe 10,000, maybe 15,000 people. He, he multiplies this food, he creates this, like, this, this miracle, spends this whole day teaching, preaching, and then feeding everybody. And then what does it say in verse 46? After telling everyone goodbye, this is, I don't know why they included that in the Bible. I think it's so sweet, right? He says goodbye to everybody. What does he do? He went up into the hills by himself to pray. He goes to the hills by himself to pray. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 depicts another time where Jesus spends an entire day 
crowds around him, preaching, teaching, hanging out, healing people, right, of their leprosy, healing people, casting out demons. And he spends that entire day, I, I can't even imagine how exhausted he must be. I mean, I, I know the pastors know that just coming up here and speaking, right, is exhausting sometimes. I mean, you're physically drained. You just have to watch Pastor Jonathan's sermon sometimes and the glistening sweat pouring off his, off his face, right? He's working, right? Working, right? And, and Jesus spends that entire day and he's like just serving and serving and serving. And in verse 35, what does it tell us that he does? Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up, went out to an isolated place to pray. And then in the next verse, it says this. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Right? But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. Right? So you get this picture. Jesus is all alone, right, in the dark in solitude, and he's just, just spending quiet time. And Peter comes to him and says, Jesus, I, we are, we've been looking for you everywhere. We've been texting you for hours, right? He says, look, you have your phone on silent mode? That little red line, that is not supposed to, we've been through this many times. You cannot put your phone on silent mode, right? It has to be on. We, we can't, how are we supposed to get a hold of you? Right? And Jesus is like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I totally forgot. I just need this time. And I know exactly what, what's going on here. I mean, when I look at my quiet time, when I look at my time that I have spending with Jesus, and the times that my, my devotional time are really long, you know why they're very long? Because I have my phone next to me. And it's constantly dinging, and I check my phone, and I answer some messages. Before you know it, I bought three things on eBay. And then I go back to my Bible, I'm trying to read. And then what do I do? And then, oh, oh, let me just take a picture of my Bible in my quiet time. Take a picture of it, post it on Be Real so my kids see it. Oh, daddy's doing his quiet time, right? And I post this thing, maybe they'll do their quiet time, right? I'm like completely backwards of what the Bible tells me to do, right? The Bible says, dude, you keep that stuff private between you and God. Like when you do your, when you pray and you, you do your devotions, that's just between you and me. The things that you need to make public are your sins, right? It says, confess your sins one to another. But of course, you know, I just do the opposite of what the Bible tells me to do. But our distractions keep us from God many times. Matthew 6, 5 is our last example. Matthew 6, 5, and we'll read that verse here. And Jesus tells us this. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private, and then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door. The King James Version, if you read that, you know what it says? It says, go in your closet and shut the door. Go in your closet and shut the door. The verses, if you, I don't have those verses here, but if you read the verses before this in verse 3, it even goes to say, if you do something good with your right hand, don't let your left hand know what's going on. That's how secretive your good things and your good acts should be. That's how private God wants his time with you. It's just you and God in the quietness of your room. You know, there is an aspect of spiritual growth that can only happen in the solitude and the quietness of the spaces of your life. There's something about that quiet time, that alone time between you and God, where you can only grow spiritually. I want you to contemplate for a second Jesus' 
Jesus' silent years that are not depicted in the Bible. When Jesus is the age of 12 to 30, 18 years of his life, we don't have anything happening in the Bible. We don't know what he did. We can assume what he did. I want you to assume what Jesus did. I want you to think for a second. What did Jesus do when he was 12 to 30? What do you think he did? What do you think, what do you think Jesus did when he was 16 years old? Think about it. What do you think Jesus did when he was 18 years old? 18. What did Jesus do when he was 22? 28 years old. Jesus, in that quiet solitude, just him, his tools, wood, and his heavenly father. Being nourished, growing, gaining that spiritual strength, alone, quiet, solitude. And I believe that during those quiet years of carpentry work, I believe that all of those preparation years, those years of growth, prepared him for those three crazy years of ministry where his meteoric rise to fame, the disciples, the crowds, the followers, the miracles, the sermons, the teaching, the healing, people shouting, Hosanna, and laying their coats down for his donkey to walk across, you know, the palm branches, and just like wanting him to be the next king of the Jews. And in an instant, everyone turns on him, cursing him, denying him, betraying him. And then he would face the darkest, fiercest challenge of his life, the cross. And I believe that, that Christ was able to face those challenges and the cross many times because of that quiet times that he spent with him and his father. And I believe, like Christ, your quiet times in your closet, in your room, kneeling by your bed, and that spiritual growth that you find in those quiet spaces prepares you also for the dark times that you will face in your life. Times in your life that, that you, are, you feel isolated, alone, cast out. Times in your life that you look up at God and you go, where are you? How, come you? how come you're not listening to me? Why don't you answer my prayers? Don't you care? And then as you are crying out to God, there is a small sliver of hope and a, and, and a memory of the God that you experienced in your closet during that, the dark times of your life, that solitude that you, that you met God in your room, and you remember that God, and you cling on to that sliver of hope. And that hope and that vision of God and that experience with God pulls you through that dark time where you start to see the light again. And you realize that God had never left you, that God had always been with you. He had been walking with you. He is running to you with his arms open wide like the prodigal son's father. My friends, most growth occurs in your quiet, dark spaces of your life. I implore you, to seek that time out with God, right? To, whether it's in your closet, whether it's in your bedroom, 
whether it's in the forest, going for a hike, to seek that solitude, that quietness, just you and God, as we together grow in our faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I'm amazed that you have poured out your love upon us who are so undeserving. But Lord, I just thank you so much for never giving up on us, for always being by our side. I pray, Father, that you would give us the courage, the strength to cast aside all our distractions and to seek you during the quietness, during the darkness, and sometimes the boring spaces of our life so that we can grow, so that we can see you and that we can be changed. Pray this in your name, amen.